In this lesson, we are going to discuss the peripheral nervous system. At the end of this video lesson, you should be able to explain how the nervous system works on processing the information from the internal and external environment to produce the specific responses needed by the body. Information is relayed throughout the body by the nerve cells or neurons. Neurons, also known as the nerve cells, are the basic units of the nervous system that transmit nerve impulses or electrical messages from one body part to another. The figure shown here is the anatomy of the most common type of neuron. Let us identify its parts. A single neuron typically consists of two general parts, the cell body and the neural processes. The nucleus and organelles are housed in the cell body, or soma. The neural processes are the extensions of the neuron that serve as passageways of signals. There are two kinds of neural processes depending on the direction of the signal. Numerous extensions of the soma are known as dendrites. These typically project like antennae to increase the surface area available for receiving signals from other neurons. In most neurons, the plasma membrane of the dendrites and cell body contains protein receptors that bind chemical messengers from other neurons. Therefore, the dendrites and cell body are the neuron's input zone because these components receive and integrate incoming signals. The axon or nerve fiber is a single, elongated, tubular extension that conducts action potentials away from the cell body and eventually terminates in other cells. The action potentials triggered near the cell body are conducted along the axon to the typically highly branched ending at the axon terminals. Functionally, therefore, the axon is the conducting zone of the neuron and the axon terminals constitute its output zone. Myelination increases the speed of conduction of action potentials. Myelinated fibers are axons covered in myelin, a thick layer composed of primarily of lipids at regular intervals along their length. Because the water-soluble ions responsible for carrying current across the membrane cannot permeate this myelin coating, it acts as an insulator. Just like plastic around an electrical wire to prevent leakage of current across the myelinated portion of the membrane. A neuron may terminate on one of the three structures, a muscle, a gland, or another neuron. Therefore, depending on where a neuron terminates, it can cause a muscle to contract, a gland cell to secrete, another neuron to convey an electrical message along a nerve pathway, or some other function. The junction between any two excitable cells is called a synapse. There are two types of synapses electrical synapses and chemical synapses, depending on how information is transferred between the two neurons. In an electrical synapse, two neurons are connected by gap junctions, which allow charge-carrying ions to flow directly between the two cells in either direction. The vast majority of synapses in the human nervous system are chemical synapses at which a chemical messenger transmits information one way across a space separating the two neurons. Now that we have the overview of the neuron anatomy and relay of information in between neurons, we can now discuss how the information is processed from the internal and external environment to relay a response. This is managed by the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system, or PNS, consists of nerve fibers that carry information between the CNS and other parts of the body. Since there are two passageways of information in the PNS, there are two primary divisions of the PNS. The afferent division of the PNS sends information about the external and internal environment to the central nervous system, or CNS. Since we get information from what we sense, this is also called the sensory division. On the other hand, the efferent division consists of nerve fibers that carry information between the central nervous system and other parts of the body. Since this division will be affecting what the brain tells us to do, it is also called the motor division. Let us first focus our discussion on the sensory or afferent division. Information sent by this division to the CNS are called stimuli. A stimulus is a change detectable by the body. Stimuli exist in a variety of energy forms or modalities such as heat, 
light, sound, pressure, and chemical changes. Afferent neurons have sensory receptors, or receptors for short, at their peripheral endings that respond to stimuli in both the external world and internal environment. Receptors have differential sensitivities to various stimuli. Depending on the type of energy to which they ordinarily respond, receptors are categorized as follows. Photoreceptors are responsive to visible wavelengths of light. Osmoreceptors detect changes in the concentration of solutes in the extracellular fluid and the resultant changes in osmotic activity. Thermoreceptors are sensitive to heat and cold. Nociceptors or pain receptors are sensitive to tissue damage, such as pinching or burning, or to distortion of tissue. Intense stimulation of any receptor is also perceived as painful. Mechanoreceptors are sensitive to mechanical energy. Examples include skeletal muscle receptors, sensitive to stretch, the receptors in the ear containing fine hairs that are bent as a result of sound waves, and blood pressure monitoring baroreceptors. And lastly, chemoreceptors are sensitive to specific chemicals. Chemoreceptors include the receptors for taste and smell, as well as those located within the body that detect oxygen and carbon dioxide concentrations in the blood or the chemical content of the digestive tract. Now that we have information from the afferent division, this will be essential for the control of the afferent output which is managed by the motor or efferent division. The efferent or motor peripheral nervous system has two major divisions, the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. Efferent output typically influences either movement or secretion. The somatic nervous system is made up of the cranial and spinal nerves to go from the central nervous system to your skeletal muscles. Thus, the somatic system controls voluntary actions. Voluntary organs such as the skeletal muscle is always stimulated. The autonomic system controls those not under conscious control, such as your heart rate, breathing, digestion, and glandular functions. Thus, the autonomic nervous system controls involuntary actions. Since these organs are controlled involuntarily, these organs function through stimulation and inhibition. Let us look at the somatic nervous system. Skeletal muscle is innervated by motor neurons, the axons of which constitute the somatic nervous system. Motor neurons are considered the final common pathway because the only way any other parts of the nervous system can influence skeletal muscle activity is by acting on these motor neurons. The somatic system is under voluntary control, but much of the skeletal muscle activity involving posture, balance, and stereotypical movements is subconsciously controlled. You may decide you want to start jogging, but you do not have to consciously bring about the alternate contraction and relaxation of the involved muscles because these movements are involuntarily coordinated by lower brain centers. Speaking of involuntarily coordinated movements, there is one somatic nervous system feature that is involuntary. This is the reflex. A reflex is a rapid involuntary response to a stimulus without the need for integration in the brain. The classic example of the stretch reflex is the patellar tendon or knee jerk reflex. The extensor muscle of the knee is the quadriceps femoris, which forms the anterior or front portion of the thigh and is attached just below the knee to the tibia or shin bone by the patellar tendon. Tapping this tendon with the rubber mallet passively stretches the quadriceps muscle, activating its spindle receptors. The resulting stretch reflex brings about the contraction of this extensor muscle causing the knee to extend and raise the foreleg in the well-known knee-jerk fashion. This test is routinely done as a preliminary assessment of nervous system function. A normal knee-jerk indicates that a number of neural and muscular components, muscle spindle, afferent input, motor neurons, afferent output, neuromuscular junctions, and the muscles themselves are functioning normally. It also indicates an appropriate balance of excitatory inhibitory input to the motor neurons from higher brain levels. Another example of a reflex is sneezing. Protective reflexes such as sneezing and coughing 
temporarily govern respiratory activity in an effort to expel irritant materials from respiratory passages. Now, let us discuss the autonomic nervous system. As mentioned earlier, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, most exocrine glands, some endocrine glands, and adipose tissue or fat are innervated by the autonomic nervous system, the involuntary branch of the peripheral efferent division. The autonomic nervous system has two subdivisions, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. In most instances, sympathetic and parasympathetic postganglionic fibers both innervate the same effector organs. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for fight-or-flight responses, which are usually present during emergencies or when faced with threats. This response is typically referred to as a fight-or-flight response because the sympathetic system readies the body to fight against or flee from and be frightened by the threat. On the other hand, the parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for the rest or digest responses which are used for energy conservation when situations are typically normal. The parasympathetic system promotes distress and digest types of bodily functions while slowing down those activities that are enhanced by the sympathetic system. The sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems generally exert opposite effects in a particular organ. Sympathetic stimulation increases the heart rate. The heart beats more rapidly and more forcefully. Blood pressure is elevated by generalized constriction or narrowing of the blood vessels. Whereas parasympathetic stimulation does the opposite. There is no need to have the heart beating rapidly and forcefully when the person is in a tranquil setting. Fight or flight responses when the body is under stress induces pupil dilation to allow more light to enter the eyes. Whereas stimulation of the parasympathetic system causes constriction because higher amount of light is not needed during unthreatening situations. Saliva is produced by the salivary glands of body when not threatened. Afferent information from the mouth, tongue, nose, and conditioned reflexes are integrated within the brain and in the presence of food, parasympathetic stimulation occurs. Increased parasympathetic stimulation results in an increased flow of saliva that is more watery in composition. Taking a deep breath in is actually linked to the sympathetic nervous system, which controls the fight-or-flight response. On the other hand, exhaling is linked to the parasympathetic nervous system, which influences our body's ability to relax and calm down. Also, parasympathetic stimulation causes bronchoconstriction, while sympathetic stimulation causes bronchodilation. Sympathetic stimulation slows down movement within the digestive tract, which decreases digestive motility, whereas parasympathetic stimulation enhances digestive motility. And for the last example, the sympathetic nervous system regulates the process of urine storage in the bladder. In contrast, the parasympathetic nervous system controls blood reconstructions and the passage of urine. To conclude this lesson, let us summarize the flow of the relay of information by the nervous system. The nervous system is organized into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The afferent or sensory division of the PNS carries information to the CNS, apprising it of the external environment and providing status reports on internal activities being regulated by the nervous system. Instructions from the CNS are transmitted via the efferent or motor division to effector organs. The efferent nervous system is divided into the somatic nervous system, which consists of the fibers of the motor neurons that supply the skeletal muscles, and the autonomic nervous system, which consists of fibers that innervate smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. The autonomic nervous system is further subdivided into the sympathetic nervous system, which controls the fight-or-flight responses, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which controls the rest or digest responses, both of which innervate most of the organs supplied by the autonomic system. And that ends our discussion on the peripheral nervous system.